Aren't you glad that Jesus came? Aren't you glad that when you cry out, he will help out? And I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tune till I met you. And I was grieving. It's 
It's higher than the others Higher than the others This name that shakes the mountain tops The only word that breaks the curses off Your name, the one that covers all It's higher than the others higher than the others full of faith and wonder I will say no other name but yours name but yours full of faith and wonder I will say no other name but yours name This name that storms the gates of hell The only word my life will live to tell Though the earth will bow beneath the sound It's higher than the others It's higher than the others Full of faith and wonder
sing it out. a home, eternal home, but for now I walk this broken world. You walked it first, you know our pain, but you show hope can rise again up from the grave. Abide with me, Abide with me, don't let me fall, and don't let go, walk with me, and never leave, ever close, God abide with me, there in the night. Gethsemane before the cross before the nails overwhelmed alone you prayed you met us in our suffering and bore our shame abide with me abide don't let me fall and don't let go. Walk with me and never leave. Ever close, God abide with me. Love that will not. sing for joy abide with me will we no more and sing for joy abide with me abide with me abide
Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As you're seated, I want you to know that today we are celebrating what happened over 2,000 years ago, where perfect love was extended from God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ, to each one of us. And I can say emphatically and clearly, and I can say without doubt, you are loved. We are all loved. And having sinned, we all deserve to be separated and cut off from God. But it was Jesus Christ who made it possible for us to be reunited with the Heavenly Father. He went through great sorrow, and he endured the cross so that we wouldn't have to. And so with thanksgiving in our hearts, we can approach this moment of communion. The Apostle Paul wanted to make sure that believers clearly understood what was happening with the receiving of the emblems of communion. And so today I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verses 23 to 28 is recorded in the message translation of the Holy Bible. The Apostle Paul wrote, let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I received my instructions from the master himself and pass them on to you. The master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and in your actions, the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy Ah. And with these instructions in mind, we prepare to receive of communion today. And we remember Christ's sacrifice. And so whether you are in the room with us, whether you are part of our FM zone, and have been served communion emblems to your car, or whether you are online and at home, and you have hastily prepared to be able to join with us in this sacred moment, I encourage you to take the emblems that you have been given, that you have prepared, 
the bread, the wafer, the grape juice. And let's just hold it up to God just for a moment. And let's pray. Let's begin by our expressing our gratitude to God for his goodness. Let's just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what these emblems represent. Thank you for the price that you have paid for us. We take the time today to remember, to reflect, and to repent in our lives. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Make us pure and holy before you. Make us into the people that you want us to be. Create in us a clean heart, Lord. Lord, we need you. We depend upon you. We trust in you, Lord. Lord, we're looking to you. We're looking to you. We're looking to you. And then let's take the opportunity in this room to peel back the thin layer one of the cup that you have received and take out the wafer that represents the bread. And with that in your hand, let us just realize that the Bible says that his body was broken so that we could be made whole. And as you break this wafer, you might be able to hear even the sound of the whip that broke his back. Let's break the bread and let us partake together. And then we peel back the next layer of this cup. We carefully do that. And we're reminded of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for us. And we take the opportunity even to partake of the cup today. Let us partake. Then let's stand together all across this place. And let's just stretch our hands to heaven. And let's be thankful for what was accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. The Bible tells us that surely he bore our sorrows and that by his stripes we are healed. I want you to know that it doesn't say he might have. It says that he did. Surely he did. It is sure. You can be confident of it. And so in this place today, you might be here and you might say, you know, it's me. I've got some sorrow. I'm bearing grief in my life. There is physical illness that I am dealing with. I want you to stretch up your hand to heaven right now and just say, surely he bore my sorrows. And by his stripes, I am healed. I am healed in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh, what a beautiful name, Jesus' name. Jesus' name, I'm healed. I'm healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I'm healed. What a beautiful name it is. In Jesus' name. Let's just pause just for a moment. If you're here today, I encourage you right where you are just to stretch a hand up to heaven. If you need a touch of Jesus in your life, whether your need is physical, financial, spiritual, or emotional, I'm here to declare that surely he is able to help you. Surely he is able to touch you. Surely 
He is able to heal you. And if you're standing there and there's somebody around you that is got their hand up, I just encourage you, even as we sing this song, as our worship team leads us in it, I want you to think about that person around you that's standing. And I want you to pray that the power of God might be released into their life right now. Oh, let's sing again. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name. Jesus' name. What a beautiful name. Jesus' name. You see every hand that is raised right now, Lord. Lord, we're reaching out to you. It's your touch that we long for. It's your touch that we need. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus touches. There is no one equal. Your name is greater than cancer. It's greater than coronavirus. Yours is the Greater than monkeypox. And yours is the glory, yours is the name Greater above all names, no rival, and you have no Your rival. Name is greater. You have no Your name is greater evil. than heart disease. Now and for Your name is greater than arthritis. You reign. Your name is greater. Yes, yours is. Just at home. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. And right now we welcome the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to work and to move. We welcome the Spirit to walk through the aisles in this place. But more than that, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon us that your spirit would touch us. Because if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, he will quicken our mortal body. And right now we pray, Lord, for the quickening of mortal bodies. We pray for healing to flow from the tip of our head to the tips of our toes. We pray, Lord, that we might sense and feel even the tingling in our fingertips. Lord, as we know that you are working in our lives. And Lord, we pray that you do it not just in this room, but that you would do it in our vehicles as we're listening, that you would do it at home as we listen to this, wherever our place of listening is. I pray, Lord, that you would allow faith to arise. I pray that you would cause us to press in. I pray that you would cause us to reach out and that, Lord, as we reach, would you make up the difference and would you touch us? Lord, heal us. Help us. We need you. We depend upon you. We trust in you. And we believe in your faithfulness. And we pray in Jesus' strong and mighty name. Hallelujah. Everybody said amen and amen. And amen. Let's sing again. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. And nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name. 
Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. So this morning I asked the question, why does God care about us? And why does he care about what happens on our planet? Why would God send his son to help us? You know, one of the arguments that is put forth by Carl Sagan in his book, A Pale Blue Dot, that is written about a picture that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope as it reached the end of the Milky Way and was given the instruction to turn around and to take a series of digital photographs and then they would be seamed together. As the Hubble Space Telescope took that incredible picture of deep space, turned around and focused towards the sun, we were able to realize that Earth itself was nothing but a pale blue dot in the big picture of things. And so Carl Sagan's argument is, is that, you know, how could we believe in a deity that has made everything, but that has put human life only on this planet? And he begins to argue away the existence of God, and he begins to argue for multiple planets that are inhabited by individuals and, and putting forth a science fiction kind of a religion. I want you to know there is something profound when we get a chance to be able to look at a picture like a pale blue dot and to realize that out of everything that God made, that the only place that we know that there is life is right here on this planet. How many know what I'm talking about? There's not life on Mars. There's not life on any of the other planets that we have seen. And so what we know is that the only place of having a knowledge of life is right here. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth for you and for me. If that doesn't make us feel loved, I don't know what does. And some would say, but pastor, so why this incredible universe that goes on and on and on? I mean, as powerful as the telescopes that we make, we are unable to see the edge of the universe. I'd suggest to you that you will never see the edge. And the reason you'll never see the edge is because our Bibles say that the universe reflects the greatness of our God. And so if the universe reflects the greatness of our God, guess what? His greatness never stops. Can you say amen to that? He is the greatest. God Almighty lives in heaven. And the earth is his footstool. And so the question is, is why would Jesus leave heaven to come to a place like this? Well, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but gain eternal life. And I'm not sure that I can improve on that summary as to why Jesus came. Simply stated, it's because God so loved the world. But I would like to talk to you a little bit about why Christ came. In fact, if you go to Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 10 to 16, we'll be able to glean from there five reasons that can be found as to why Christ came. Number one, Jesus came to carry many to glory. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10 says it this way. 
It says from the living Bible, and it was right and proper that God who made everything for his own glory should allow Jesus to suffer. For in doing this, he was bringing vast multitudes of God's people to heaven. For his suffering made Jesus a perfect leader, one fit to bring them into their salvation. Now, I want you to know the idea of he was able to bring large multitudes, great multitudes into heaven is translated in another version as he was able to carry or lead many into glory. But how was he able to do that? He was only able to do it, and the key to this verse, I believe, is where it tells us that Christ was perfect Perfected in the place of suffering. He was made perfect in suffering. Now, this is an incredible concept, but the word that is translated perfect can also mean complete. So some would say and ask the question, well, pastor, if Jesus was only made perfect in suffering then do you mean to tell me that he wasn't perfect when he was born in a manger? And didn't he live a sinless life? And wasn't his death the death of an innocent man? Absolutely. He was morally perfect. And that is one kind of perfection or completion. But there is another kind of perfection or completion that I'd like to talk about. And this is the one that comes only by experience. Because Jesus entered fully into the sufferings of this world and he emerged victorious over them. He was completed in his experience on the earth by the things that he suffered. And that's why he may be called the perfect leader of our salvation in the sense that he was the pioneer or trailblazer. He's the one who came and suffered on the sin-cursed planet so that by virtue of his sinless life and by his death, he might blaze a trail back for us to God. Christ came to blaze that trail so that we might follow him to glory. But the trail is marked with suffering with tears, with rejection, and it leads to a cross. And anyone who follows Jesus is going to end up where he ended up. We're going to end up at some point at the foot of the cross, at the edge of a hill shaped like a skull. But we must remember that He doesn't just lead us to heaven. He leads us to glory. And there is glory at the end of the Christian life. No pain, no gain. Jesus came from heaven so that we might follow him in suffering and be made like him, be made complete through suffering. So at the end of it all, we can receive the prize of the glory that is set before us. Can anybody say amen? Amen. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. But Jesus didn't just talk of love. Jesus showed it. He wasn't about saying that he loved. He was about demonstrating it. And he set an example for us on how to live. In fact, the Bible says, tells us that in speaking with his disciples, he said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for a friend. And if that is how the greatest of human love is measured, if we apply the same principle to the divine, then the greatest love of all, the perfect love, was demonstrated when Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Can you say amen? Amen. But secondly, Jesus came to connect us 
with our Father, God. And it's interesting that God is viewed as a father. Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 11 to 13 says this. It says, we who have been made holy by Jesus have the same father he has. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. So catch that. We have the same father. God is our father. And if God is our father, then Jesus refers to us as his brothers and sisters. So for all of us in this room, we can say that Jesus is my brother. Yes. In relationship with Christ. He not only saves us, but he welcomes us into the family, and we are his brothers. And the Bible says, it continues, verse 12, for he says in the book of Psalms, catch this, I will talk to my brothers, and so Jesus is talking to you and me about God, my Father, and together we will what? Sing his praises. Wow. When I read this, I thought to myself, I thought, are you kidding me? How did I miss this? Man, if nobody is singing along with the worship team, I can assure you Jesus is. Because as long as the song brings glory to God the Father, Jesus is on beat, he's on tune, and he's on time. Can you say amen to that? And there's just something about it. And so we worship together. So if you're ever at a place where, Jesus, I can't find you. Where are you, Jesus? The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And so when we worship the Lord, Jesus steps in and he worships God the Father with us. Is that not unbelievable? It was for me. Anyway... It continues and says, at another time, he said, I will put my trust in God along with my brothers. And still at another time, see, here I am and the children God gave me. Like, it's just amazing to read the number of times that this scripture refers to the importance of family. And so as family, we worship God. In his family, Jesus shows us who God the Father is. He shows us divine love. Because he came to be one of us. And so we're connected. But he's also connected with his father. Now, suppose a man goes outside one night and looks up at the stars. By looking up at the stars, could he know that there is a God? If he went north and saw the spectacular light show of the Aurora Borealis or south to the Grand Canyon and saw the incomparable beauty of the hewn rock or traveled over to uh, Yosemite and and saw its splendor or to Niagara Falls or, or to a beautiful redwood forest north California, Could he be sure that there is a God? Well, the book of Romans tells us that even by looking at nature, we can identify that there is a God. And so if we looked at nature, we would see by its intricate design and by the pattern of creation that none of this could have happened by chance. You talk to somebody who is a strong believer in evolution and you talk to them about something like the human eye and its detail and you would have a hard time having them come up with a way that that could have just evolved. It must have happened by design. And so through careful study, Humanity could conclude that there is a God. But how much could humanity conclude about God simply by studying 
nature. Humanity could understand that God is a God of wisdom and power. They could understand that God is creative and infinitely so. But no one could discover the love of God simply by studying a bombardier beetle or by looking at the antelope. He would never know. You know, God even, if God was, or he wouldn't know God's name, or he wouldn't know that God cared about him. The God of the stars and of the sun and of the moon would be great and powerful, but he would never be personal. How many know that that great God became personal through Jesus Christ? Can you say amen to that? And when Jesus came to this earth, these verses tell us that we share a common humanity with Jesus, and he's not ashamed to call us his brothers. God has come down where we live, and he has become one of us. He didn't yell down, I love you. He didn't mail us a letter so that we could read it. He took on our nature, and he was born just as we're born. He was Alive just as we're alive. He died just as we die. So that when he says, I love you, we can understand him. Because in Jesus Christ, God has come to be one of us. And the third reason that Jesus came to this earth is found in verses 14 and 15. It is that Jesus came to crush the enemy of our souls. Since we, as God's children, are human beings made of flesh and blood, he became flesh and blood too by being born in human form. For only as a human being could he die and in dying break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in that way could he deliver those who, through fear of death, have been living all their lives as slaves to constant dread. I want you to know that deep down in human hearts, there is a fear of death that Satan has used to keep us enslaved. Don't miss this point. Satan has no independent power to kill you or anyone else. He cannot touch you. He can do nothing to you without God's permission. But he plays upon our fear of death to keep us in the chains of sin. And that's why the Bible says that the sting of death is sin. And sadly, too many die with their sins still upon them, like a heavy burden, a big weight that bears down on them. They die miserable, angry, frustrated, and fearful because they don't know what to do with their sins. And that's where it's imperative that we share our message. If we know somebody that's sick, if we know someone in the hospital, we need to take every opportunity, even in those last moments, to share the love of Jesus Christ. It's one thing for us to share our love, but it's another to share the love of Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life so that they might live eternally. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Some claim that death is a natural part of life. And this is certainly true in the sense that death comes to all of us because we live in a fallen world. Where sin exists, death is indeed natural. But that's only part of the picture. Death reigns because of Adam's sin. But through Jesus Christ... In his infallible word, we can state that whoever believes in Jesus will never die. Can you say amen to that? Jesus said it himself. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. Story is told of a young boy who was about four years of age who had a terminal disease. At first, he didn't understand his condition, but finally he realized that he wasn't going to get better. 
and that he'd never play with his friends again. One morning, he asked his mother, Mom, am I going to die? And choking back her emotion, she said, Yes, dear. Mommy, what is death like? Will it hurt? (laughs) The overwhelmed mother ran out of the room to the kitchen, and she leaned up against the refrigerator. Her knuckles gripped hold of the appliance to keep her from falling as she cried. And she prayed and asked the Lord to give her an answer for her young son. Suddenly, an idea came, and she went back into her little boy's room, and she sat down on the bed, and she said, Johnny, do you remember how you used to play outside all day? And when you came inside at night, you were so tired that you just fell down on the couch and fell asleep. In the morning, you woke up, and you were in your own bed, and you wondered, how did I get here? But during the night, your father would pick you up and would carry you to your own bed. Do you remember? Johnny nodded his head in agreement. His eyes were wide open. She continued, that's what death is like. One night you lie down and go to sleep. And in the middle of the night, your heavenly father comes and picks you up and carries you to your own bed. In the morning when you wake up, you're in your own room in heaven. The little boy smiled and nodded. Several weeks later, he died peacefully. And that's what death is like for us as Christians. Satan's hold is broken. The fear of death has been taken away. Fourthly, Jesus came to cover our sins. Hebrews 2 and verses 16 to 17 says, we all know that he did not come as an angel, but as a human being. Yes, a Jew. And it was necessary for Jesus to be like us, his brothers, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God, a priest who would be both merciful to us and faithful to God in dealing with the sins of the people. Some translations introduce a strong theological term in verse 17. I stayed away from it. And yet I believe it's important for us to consider the term is the word propitiation. In essence, they describe how Jesus had to be made like us so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. But what does that term mean? It is so rich. Let me try to explain it. Here it is, propitiation. God cannot wink at sin. Before I can have peace with God, my sin must be dealt with. There is no escape from this fact because God is 100% righteous and will not clear the guilty. Any solution to sin's problem must face that fact. So what gift can I bring? Is there something I can do to turn him away from his wrath? Can I give him money? No, because all of the money in the world, the silver and gold comes from him. He has the power to create wealth. What about animals? Can I bring him some kind of animal sacrifice? No, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. What about my possessions? The one who made the stars is lacking in nothing. What could I bring to turn away God's wrath? 
What could I bring? Nothing. God knew that. He knew that I didn't have anything to offer, so he offered the gift of his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die in my place. That's the mercy of God. When Jesus died, his death on the cross was the perfect sacrifice for sin. And his death satisfied the righteousness of God. God's anger was turned away by the offering of his own son. The father was propitiated. The blood of Jesus has paid the debt and turned God's righteous wrath that was against me away from me. That's propitiation. 1 John 2 and verse 2 states, and he himself, Jesus, is the propitiation of our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Understand this, Jesus is not simply the propitiator, but he is the propitiation. He is the sacrifice. He is the one who satisfies the justice of God. This term points to Jesus as the only sacrifice, and it shows what effect his death effectively accomplished. Christ, who was perfected in the place of suffering, is now the priestly propitiator, saved us in a way that kept God's holiness intact. And it's an incredible concept. Finally, number five, Jesus came to come alongside us in our temptations. Hebrews 2 and 18 says this, for since he himself has now been through suffering and temptation, he knows what it's like when we suffer, when we are tempted, and he is wonderfully able to help us. The word translated help here, catch it now, comes from two Greek words. And those two Greek words in combination mean when we cry help, when it says he's able to help us, it means that he is able to run to give help when someone cries out. That tells me the kind of God that we have in heaven. Jesus walked in my shoes. Jesus left heaven to taste what I am going through. And when I get discouraged, when I get despondent, when I want to throw in the towel, I cry out, and he comes running to help me. I know someone who never forgets my name. I know someone who is never too busy for me. I know someone who knows me through and through better than I know myself, who knows all of my fears, all of my hopes, all of my dreams. He knows my motives and my hidden thoughts. I know someone who cares for me and knows me intimately and loves me anyway. That someone's name is Jesus. And when I cry out, he runs to my side. Oh, I think as we get set to conclude of the second verse of the much-loved hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus that encourages us in this way. It says, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. 
take it to the Lord in prayer. Aren't you glad that Jesus came? Aren't you glad that when you cry out, he will help out? And that help means that he will run in your direction and come alongside to help. Let's pray together. Lord, today as we bring conclusion to our time, we want to thank you so much for the sense of your presence that fills this place. We pray, Lord, that you would allow us to take the truth of this scripture and to be able to walk with it. Lord, to be able to run with it. To be able to deposit it in our hearts and in our lives and to be liberated by it. You came. You lived. You died. So that through your life and through your death, your love, your person was perfected to the place that you can lead us all to glory. Help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you. When we stumble, would we realize that we have someone that we can turn to that will help us, be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
waiting. God's so love.